Hey guys, welcome back to the show, and on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie that may just change the way you look at snakes for the rest of your life. Which is why I'm going to be playing Devil's Advocate again and defending snakes from this totally unjustified stigma. Now, the original title for this movie was King Cobra, which is totally lame compared to its release title, Jaws of Satan. Combining Jaws and Satan, that's pretty badass. And take a look at this poster with the snake in there. It's pretty cool. So the movie starts on this train where they're bringing dogs to a racetrack and a snake to a carnival. But this isn't any ordinary snake. It has supernatural powers, like the ability to open locks. Then it scares train guy number one and uses its powers to open the train door and then... I'm not exactly sure what happens. The guy moves over to the opening and falls out. So maybe the snake has the ability to control people. I don't know. Fine, let's just go with that. Then it pops up in front of train guy number two and even more spooky things happen. Like how out of nowhere there's a glass partition separating the guy from the snake. There's some kind of black curtain. And if we look over here, it appears as if someone is handling the snake on top of a table. That's strange. I don't remember there being a table there before. Or a man. Or woman with very hairy arms. Now, this glass partition thing has been used before in movies. The first thing that comes to mind for me is Raiders of the Lost Ark. However, the only problem with it is that it can be very hard to avoid reflections in the glass. But in this case, I think the most glaring problems are the scratches on the glass and everything going on in the right side of the frame. This, you've really got to try to avoid. So the snake bites him, but the funny thing is, the sound effect basically sounds like the snake bumping into the glass. Anyways, the train comes to a stop because I'm assuming the snake used its snake powers to stop it. And now we have Reverend Tom Farrow, who's reading a book by the fire when suddenly the fire is gone. Looks like he didn't pay his heating bill. Yeah, that's right. It's for gas and fire. Both provide heat. And you know what? I'm actually okay with this. He's a priest. He spent his whole life bad-mouthing hell. And what? He just thinks he gets to enjoy the fire it provides? <sighs> well, <laughs> no. But not only that, it appears that the fireplace is cold to the touch. Which can only mean one thing. Satan has arrived, because we all know how much he hates fire. So then later that night, he goes to a party, because there's no booze like free booze, and this is where he meets the town psychic, who wants to read his coffee cup, when suddenly she passes out from shock. Turns out that coffee cup was empty the whole time. Not only is Father Pharaoh a man of God, it appears he is also a man of mime. Okay, so this is actually something that drives me nuts when I'm watching movies or TV shows. Uh, a lot of the time, not always, but most of the time, when you see someone drinking out of a mug or a cup, it's usually empty. There's a lot of reasons for this, but the reason why it drives me so crazy is that as soon as I notice it, it totally takes me out of the illusion. And fountain drinks are the worst for it, because unless the actor is really good at miming, it's very easy to see that the cup is empty because there's no weight to the cup when they're moving it around. And then if they set it down on a surface, you can hear the echo inside of the cup because it's empty. So then she tells him that she saw the devil in his coffee, but he's not exactly buying it. Well, let me put it this way. If the devil came to earth to destroy a priest, he'd choose one that was worth destroying, wouldn't he? <laughs> Someone worthy of his attention. Father, I'm very sure about this. What don't you get, Father? She said she's very sure of this. She saw the devil in your coffee. How could you doubt that? Let's be honest here. If the devil's going to show up in something, it's going to be something hot. And it's not going to be tea. That's, that's too dainty. You know, you got the, you get the little bag that you're dipping in there. It's just not the same effect. So as the Reverend goes and sits down, we see the silhouette of the snake behind him. At least I hope it's the snake and not a flasher playing shadow puppets. And now we have Dr. Sheridan, and she's investigating what happened to the two guys who got killed on the train. So she goes to talk to the coroner, who is 
kind of like the comic relief in this movie, at least for a few minutes. You know what, there's a part of me that appreciates this because I think you gotta have a sense of humor to do that job. Either that or you just really gotta like being around dead people. Which wouldn't be so bad for about an hour, but then after that I think it would get kind of depressing. So he's like, check this out, probably some kind of a snake bite. If there's some kind of dangerous snake crawling around, maybe we ought to make some sort of announcement. I'd watch myself if I were you. What's that supposed to mean? Matt Perry has everything staked on that dog track opening. Yeah, Dr. Sheridan. Do you know how an announcement about a deadly snake will screw up the opening of that dog track? Well, do you? I'm seriously asking because I don't. People want to come to our town to watch dogs run around a track and bet money on it. Not worry about getting bitten by snakes. And if you want to put out a statement out there that there may be a venomous snake somewhere, well, you might as well just kiss the tourism industry goodbye. So I'm under the impression that the cobra can use its powers to control other snakes, or it's just super manipulative because it gets this rattlesnake to bite this guy just because it can, I guess. So she calls in an expert, Dr. Hendricks. And it's like, hey, check out this bite. Oh, wait, this is the wrong guy. Turns out the dead body with the snake bite was cremated. Probably part of some big cover up by city officials to get that dog track open. Because my God, there's money to be had, people. Dog track. Anyways, the psychic calls up Father Pharaoh and she's like, the devil is here. I'll come tell you about it later. And the really frustrating thing about this scene is that we don't get to see what happened that prompted her to make that phone call. Uh, she was in a diner and I just keep thinking how hilarious it would be if it just suddenly cut to a shot of a snake sitting in a booth, just staring at her, you know, like a cup of coffee, maybe a piece of pie. <laughs> so Dr. Sheridan hijacks another snake bite victim to show Dr. Hendricks on his way to the airport. And look, it's the psychic. Now here's a confusing scene. So a report comes in that the snake is inside of a hardware store. So the sheriff goes to check it out. And look at all the people gathered outside to watch the action. Either this is a very popular store or everyone is just really bored in this town. So the sheriff finds the snake in the back of the store and I'm just gonna show you this unedited. Okay, so I'm guessing that scene was cut to look like he shot and killed the snake, but to me, it doesn't look like that's what happened. It looks like the snake just fell on the ground and is now coming towards him. But I think the movie was trying to convey that he killed the snake, which, in my opinion, is just another unjustified police shooting. That snake was just sitting there. It wasn't bothering anybody. I think the cops wanted to kill that snake from the get-go. Just listen to how the report came in. Sheriff, they got some kind of snake over at Willard's Hardware. Anybody hurt? Well, no, they got it boxed in. Well, what kind of snake is it? A uh, black one. So anyways, Dr. Sheridan comes home after a long day and oh my God, it's the cobra. And you know what that means. It means there's a different snake somewhere nearby and there it is, another rattlesnake. Now I have to admit, if it was me in this situation, I would probably uh, just grab the covers, throw them over the snake and get the hell out of there burn the whole house down, never tell anybody what really happened, and just start a new life somewhere else and never admit that I was scared of the snake. But Dr. Sheridan has an even better idea. She's going to sit there, dial the phone, call Dr. Hendricks and wait for him to get over there. And I gotta hand it to Dr. Hendricks, he's super fast. He's able to throw on some clothes, run down those stairs, and break into Dr. Sheridan's house in no time. And it's a good thing he brought his snake hook, which he uses to wrangle the snake and pin it up against the headboard. But, you know, maybe it wasn't that much of a fight. I'm not trying to judge, but maybe the snake was kind of into that sort of thing. Maybe that's what the snake was looking for when it went there. We shouldn't just assume that all snakes are evil. Snakes have needs too, people. I think it's about time that we acknowledge that, we accept it, and we respect it. 
Why is the assumption always that, oh, the snake was trying to hurt somebody? Maybe it was just, you know, in the mood and just went into the bed like, yeah, just pin me up against this headboard and do whatever you gotta do. I guess the only thing left to do is take it to animal control or have it released back into the wild somewhere outside of town. Or you could show that snake who's boss, because even though Dr. Hendricks is a herpetologist, he's also judge, jury, and executioner. Bang! So he blows the snake's brains out, and the Satan snake is like, oh, okay, just gonna mosey on out of here. And I guess all that snake wrangling action really heated things up because the next morning they're eating breakfast together. And you know what that means. They probably made breakfast together, which is super hot. I also think this would be a hilarious cut if they were eating snake for breakfast. <laughs> I don't know why, but all the time I always think about what would be a really funny transition. You know, like if that scene just started with her going to him like, would you like some more coffee with your snake and eggs? So anyway, she goes to talk to the mayor and she's like, you gotta warn people. And he's like, damn it, I've got a dog track to open up. You know, sometimes to make an omelet, you gotta crack a few eggs and kill a few snakes. Then Father Pharaoh finds out there's a curse on his family and Satan is after his soul. And oh crap, there he is. So now we have this. I guess you could call it a chase scene through the graveyard until the father falls into an open grave. Well, it looks like he's done for. There's no escaping the Satan snake now, but it's a good thing that this is one of those discount graveyards because a piece of this fencing breaks off and look, it's the sign of the cross and Satan hates that sort of thing. So now Dr. Sheridan and Dr. Hendricks have gathered the whole town together for a meeting somehow in order to announce the threat of deadly snakes until the mayor barges in and tries to tell everyone there's nothing to worry about. There's a dog track to be opened after all. Yeah, what about that kid at the lake? Yeah, Did they find the body yet? Kids have been drowning at Moccasin Lake ever since I can remember. Yeah, kids die all the time. Especially at that lake. That's totally normal. Nothing to be concerned about. It's a part of our tradition, actually. You know, the, you know what they say, every time a kid dies, an angel gets its wings, or something. I love how the dog track is kind of like the equivalent of the beach in Jaws. We're opening that dog track, snakes or no snakes. Even though everybody knows that a dog track is the natural hunting ground for reptiles. So while Dr. Sheridan is driving home, she can't seem to avoid an even bigger threat than the snakes, getting hit on. Hey, how are you? Seriously though, this guy is actually an assassin hired by Matt Perry, who's appeared multiple times throughout this movie, but to be honest, I don't really know what he does. I think he's just a really rich guy who invested in the dog track. Anyways, he hired this hitman to get rid of Dr. Sheridan, but he's not a very good one. Because instead of just getting the job done, he decides to get pervy with it. And the Cobra shows up and saves the day. Well, kinda. It still tries to kill Dr. Sheridan and break her window, but stop the rape, so that's a plus. And now it's the big day. The opening of the illustrious dog track. And look at this, just look at all these people walking around outside. They're sitting ducks for God's sakes. Nowhere is safe, not even inside the dog track or even inside of the utility room of the dog track where Matt Perry's daughter, played by Christina Applegate in her first feature film, gets bitten by a rattlesnake. And she's like, oh God, my leg! Well, well, Mr. Perry, everyone tried to warn you and now your daughter might die. All because you just had to get that sweet opening day dog track money. Was it worth it to see those dogs go woof, woof, woof in a circle for a few hours and then watch all that money pour in? Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, it might have been worth it. So Dr. Hendricks goes searching for places where snakes might be and he finds a cave with a king cobra in it. 
Then he shows a sketch of the snake to Father Pharaoh, and he's like, that's him, that's the guy. So Dr. Hendrix goes back into the cave, but I guess he wasn't prepared for the slippery rocks, and he slides down and somehow gets knocked out. Jesus, dude. Then Dr. Sheridan walks into the cave, but we don't really see what happens. She just suddenly ends up lying on a rock under the snake. Like, okay. Did the snake use his powers to control her? You know, if the snake has these powers, why didn't the snake just control people in the first place? You know? You could have just controlled people to kill Father Pharaoh. That would have been the smart thing to do. Oh, but I guess it's Satan and he's like, I gotta kill him myself. Anyways, Father Pharaoh is conducting a mass, but reaches that point that I think all priests get to at one point or another, where he says, screw this shit, it's time to go kick some ass. So he goes into the cave and takes Dr. Sheridan off of the sacrificial snake stone or whatever, and takes her place and starts praying. The snake just kind of sits there, and then suddenly there's a beam of light. Not sure how this got in here. It's a cave, so must be divine. Oh, probably, you know, God or something. And Father Pharaoh uses his cross to reflect the light and set the snake on fire, which is just kind of an unsatisfying conclusion. That's the end of the movie, by the way. It's just over. I mean, I guess you could call it a final battle, but it was more like a comedy of errors. The snake expert slips and falls. The doctor somehow just ends up incapacitated at the foot of the snake. Feet of the snake? Tail of the snake? I don't know. Below the snake. And the priest who uses the same technique that I used to use to kill ants as a kid. I would have liked to see some more fight out of the snake, you know, considering that it was Satan and it had all these demonic powers that throughout the movie just went more and more unused for some reason. I mean, at the beginning of the movie, he's like, you know, throwing people out of trains and stuff, and by the end, it's like, oh no, reflected sunlight, ugh. From the opening sequence, you kind of got this impression that, wow, this snake is gonna be pretty badass. It's, it's gonna be pretty hard to defeat this snake. But by the end, you know, the snake was just kind of a bitch. When you think about it, it just got other snakes to do its dirty work the whole movie. The real battle in this movie was between the doctors and the people trying to open up that dog track. That was the main conflict in this thing. It's kind of funny how this movie took some notes from Jaws, obviously. It just didn't work nearly as well. But that's it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.